Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Julianne Worden, and I will be your moderator this evening as we travel along with Rick. Tonight, we are exploring Europe's micro countries from Vatican City to Andorra. And now, without further ado, I'll turn things over to Rick Steves, who will be our tour guide this evening. Hi, Rick. Hey, Julianne. Nice to see you. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks to everybody for joining us because it is Monday night travel. Mm. I love Monday nights. I get to kind of think about what we can share, how we can enthuse. Remember this Swiss Army knife? Used to travel with this all the time. I just traveled with this a week ago when I was hiking around Mount Blanc. Then I went to Paris. I want to tell you a little bit about my trip to Europe, just to give you a little update on travel during the pandemic and so on. And uh, that'll be a little break halfway through the program. But right now, I just want to welcome you in. Make yourself at home. This is what we do every Monday night. We get together. In a normal year, I spend 100 days in Europe researching my guidebooks, leading our tours, and making TV shows. Of course, for the last two summers, we have not been able to do that. But this darn stupid COVID thing can derail our plans, but it can't stop our travel dreams. And this is where we gather. We rendezvous every Monday to enthuse about Europe. I'm so glad you're here. And today we've got a special show. We're going to see the little countries in Europe. I can hardly wait to take to each one of them. I want you to make yourself at home. I got you, hope you got your favorite travel partner with you. I hope you got a glass of wine or something to drink. I'm drinking uh, Chianti Reserva. Reserva is a good name. And uh, Chianti used to be just simple table wine in Italy. But now they have limited the production and they've uh, raised the bar. And it's considered a nice quality wine. And it takes me right back to Chianti country where the beautiful beef is around Siena and Florence and so on. I've got my antipasto spread here. Uh, this is just a beautiful little collection of, uh, you know, roasted vegetables and meat and cheese. And, uh, oh, I've got some, you know, I've got some smoked pork sausage and some salami. And this Parmigiano Reggiano is my, my I've raved about it before, but it's just like, to me, it's like candy. And um, I got that with, I got my garlic bread. And that'll be fun to eat it together, wash down with the wine. And um, I want to remind you today, we are going to visit a show that we produced a few years ago. And let me just take you to the website, because I want to remind you that every TV show we have ever produced is available for you for free, just a click away. For instance, I'm on the homepage of ricksteves.com. Our newest show is the best of the Alps. Imagine hiking on that ridge. I just did with the TV crew, but when we were last filming in Europe and that whole one hour special is right there. And then down here, you've got a catalog of 150 Rick Steves TV shows covering Europe in a hundred and over a hundred little half hour slices from top to bottom, east to west. And it includes all of our specials, each one of these one hour specials that you can, depending on your mood, click into anytime you like. Now, today we are going to a country that you can't find on here because it's too little. And But if you go to any one of these um, countries where there is a little country like Italy, and you can look around here and say, little Europe, five micro countries. And two of them are actually in Italy, San Marino and the Vatican City. So anytime you wanna see any of our shows, uh, you can always go there and check it out. Right now, we're gonna go to see the show on Little Europe. And can you imagine when we go to Edinburgh and film a half hour show in Edinburgh, everything is a 20 minute taxi ride away. It's quite easy. In this show, we got five countries scattered all over Europe in a half hour show. We normally allocate six days to, to shoot one show in Europe. And then we have to take it home and do all the post-production work. But this was a complicated and time consuming shoot. We did it over a couple of years when we were in Barcelona. Let's drive up into the Pyrenees and we'll do Andorra. When we were in Switzerland, let's head on over to that little country nestled in the mountains between Switzerland and Austria and we'll do Liechtenstein. We cheated on two of the five because we shot them for other shows and we just replay, we, we replayed them. In the French Riviera, of course, you got Monaco and Monte Carlo. Well, we pulled that out and we've got that woven in with the five countries. And when you do Rome, you cover the Vatican and the Vatican City is its own little country. So we beefed that up a little bit and used that and then what other show do we have? San Marino nestled up into the mountains of, uh, in the mountains of Italy. So we're gonna see all of these countries and I want, as I'll demonstrate later on, they are really small. You think Luxembourg's small? Well, Luxembourg's the size of the pizza crust 
And these five countries are like little pieces of sausage scattered in there. There's plenty of room to rattle around. These little tiny countries make Luxembourg look like Texas, okay? So we're gonna check that out. And my challenge as the writer of the script was not to just fall into the kitschy little touristy gimmicky stuff about these you know, toy countries, but to look and see what is the real historic reason for these cultures. These are proud cultures. And we did that in these scripts. So I hope that you enjoy that. And right now I wanna thank you again for joining us on Monday Night Travel and welcome you to travel with me as we do every Monday night. And we're gonna start right now with the little countries in Europe. Rick Steves, and I'm standing atop one of the tiniest countries in Europe. Europe has a handful of these little don't blink or you'll miss them lands. There's Andorra, Liechtenstein, Monaco, Vatican City, and San Marino. We're about to visit them all. This time, it's Little Europe. Thanks for joining us. And these are the little countries. So we thought we would bring back our little pianist, the boy wonder, our good buddy from Minnesota, 11 year old Brennan Cogswell. He's a great musician and he wants to show you how he designed, he uh, uh, arranged the tune you just saw by Jerry Frank from Seattle into his own piano piece. So here is Brennan Cogswell, our favorite little buddy from Minnesota playing for you the Rick Steves Europe theme on his own piano. I'm Brennan Cogswell, I'm 11 years old, and I really like the Rick Steves Europe TV show. I also like playing the really cool theme song on piano. Yay, Brennan, keep on traveling. Medieval Europe was a patchwork of minuscule dukedoms, princedoms, and feudal states. Modern day Germany, about the size of Montana, was fragmented into over 300 of these, each with its own petty ruler, weights and measures, crown jewels, and curfew. These countries were only about as big as the distance a cannon could fire from the town walls. And today, only a handful of Europe's many nations survive. The world's smallest country comes with the planet's biggest church. Another is famous for its casino and car races. A stone's throw from the Adriatic Sea, the last of the independent hill towns, still looks pretty formidable. This castle-guarded principality is a remnant of Europe's once mighty Holy Roman Empire. And here, where Spain and France meet, another tiny country entertains shoppers and hikers alike with the rugged beauty of the Pyrenees. Europe's microstates are scattered far and wide. We'll start at Vatican City, drop by San Marino, hike up to Liechtenstein, speed over to Monaco, and finish high in the Pyrenees at Andorra. Our first country is ruled by a man from another country. It has less than a thousand permanent residents, and its birth rate is zero. It's visited by hordes of tourists daily, and it's the capital of a holy empire with more than a billion subjects worldwide. Any guesses? The Vatican City. This is the smallest independent country on Earth. Even though it occupies less than a square mile, 
this country has its own radio station, newspaper, post office, and a cute little train station. <laughs> Along with the grandest church on earth, it has a massive museum. The Vatican is ruled, both politically and religiously, by the Pope. Vatican City is embedded in the city of Rome. It's surrounded by a mighty medieval wall that evokes a less than peaceful history. After the Roman Empire fell in the fifth century, the city of Rome gradually came under control of the Pope. In fact, for centuries, the Pope was called the King Pope. Little by little, the King Pope built his own empire. At its peak, around the 17th century, the Papal States, as they were called, encompassed much of the Italian peninsula. When the modern nation of Italy was united, it absorbed most of the Papal States, including the city of Rome. But the Pope held out. For 60 years, the Pope was holed up here, behind the Vatican walls. Finally, in 1929, the Pope and Mussolini signed the Lateran Treaty, establishing the Vatican as its own nation. The garden-like core of the country, where serious administration takes place, is closed to the public. The Vatican military is made up of the Swiss Guard. In 1506, the Pope imported mercenaries from Switzerland, who are known for their loyalty and courage. Today, about 100 Swiss soldiers still protect the Pope, keep the crush of tourists as orderly as possible, and wear the flamboyant Renaissance-style uniform that tourists just love to photograph. The Vatican has its own postal service. Many consider it to be more reliable than mailing things from across the street in Italy. And Vatican stamps are a fun souvenir. By the way, that was in the old days. Tourists, I remember when I was a kid, actually avoided the Italian mail and they did all their postage chores in the Vatican City because those went reliably and fast, airmail. I mean, hitch a ride with the Holy Spirit, I guess. But when you mailed your stamp from anywhere else in Italy, you'd, have to, you'd probably beat it home. That was the thing. The Vatican is built on the memory and tomb of the first pope, St. Peter. Piazza San Pietro sits on what was the site of a Roman racetrack. Imagine chariots making their hairpin turns around that obelisk. For added entertainment during the games, Christians were executed here. In about 65 AD, the Apostle Peter was crucified within sight of this obelisk. His friends buried him in a humble graveyard atop what pagan Romans called the Vatican Hill. For about 250 years, Christians worshipped quietly on this spot. Then, when Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity in 313 AD, a basilica was built here, and this became the head of the Roman Catholic Church. 1,200 years later, the original St. Peter's was replaced by this, the most glorious church in all Christendom. Upon entering, your first impression is it's big, over 600 feet long, bathed in glorious sunbeams. It can accommodate thousands of worshipers. Near the entrance, Michelangelo's Pietà is adored by pilgrims and tourists alike. Here, the 25-year-old Michelangelo intends to make the theological message very clear. Jesus, once alive but now dead, gave his life for our salvation. The contrast provided by Mary's rough robe makes his body, even carved in hard marble, seem soft and believable. The high altar, like so much of the art decorating the Vatican, is a masterpiece by the great Baroque artist Bernini with sunlight illuminating its alabaster window as if powering the Holy Spirit, it encrusts the legendary throne of St. Peter with a starburst of Baroque praise. Directly above the altar, which marks the tomb of St. Peter, stands Bernini's bronze canopy, and above that, Michelangelo's dome, taller than a football field on end. The inscription declares, in Latin, Tu es Petrus, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. This is the scriptural basis for the primacy of Rome in the Catholic Church. A viewing perch gives travelers a close-up look at those huge letters and a heavenly perspective into the church. From the rooftop, you can size up the dome you're about to climb. For a close look at Michelangelo's dome within a dome design, lean in as you climb 300 steps to the cupola. The view from the top is unrivaled, both of the city of Rome and of the Vatican grounds. You can survey the entire country from this lofty perch. 
The long rectangular building is the Vatican Museum with the adjacent Sistine Chapel. These buildings and courtyards display some of the greatest art of Western civilization. Over the centuries, the popes have amassed enough art to fill what many consider Europe's richest museum. Long halls are sumptuously decorated with precious tapestries, frescoed ceilings, and ancient statues. The museum features art from every age. Its exquisite painting gallery includes Raphael's much-loved painting of the Transfiguration. Mm. Halls and courtyards are littered with ancient Greek masterpieces, like the Laocoon, so inspirational to the great masters of the Renaissance. And the Pope's apartments tell Christian history. This is the battle in which Emperor Constantine was led by angels and a holy cross, both to a key military victory and to his own religious conversion. And these rooms celebrate pre-Christian philosophy. Here, Raphael paints the School of Athens, the who's who of ancient Greek intellectual heroes, many painted with the features of Renaissance greats, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and a self-portrait of Raphael in the black cap. But of course, we've just scratched the surface. If you're pondering eternity, try covering the Vatican Museum thoroughly. Oh man, you know, it just occurred to me, this is a delight. I hope you're having a good time. I'm enjoying my wine. I'm enjoying my antipasti. I love to just use this toothpick and, and grab a, a roasted piece of mm, beet or a, a spear of asparagus or whatever and dream about these travels. I wanna remind you, we can't do this without our team. I wanna take a moment here to thank Julianne, who's um, co uh, moderating this particular episode of Monday Night Travel. Lisa is behind the scenes right now, answering your questions and, and helping you out on the chat section. Um, we've also got Gabe on our team and Ben, a lot of you got to know Ben. And right now Ben has taken about, I think he's about a year gonna be in Russia in a study program there, but I think he'll be dropping into to let us know what it's like in Russia on a future episode of Monday Night Travel. By the way, I'm going to Europe in a, in a few weeks and then we're gonna have a few uh, guest appearances and we're gonna have a chance for our entire staff, Julianne, Gabe, Lisa, and maybe Ben, if we can get a hold of them in Russia, all sharing their favorite travel insights. Um, remember with each week, we've got questions and answers and you've got the, the little um, box down there. So fill in your questions and Julianne will try to get to them uh, with me after the video. And we've got links in the chat widget where you can connect with whatever we're talking about in the show. Also this week for our first time ever, we're going to do a flash poll. You just saw the Vatican City. There are four more little countries coming up. So when I'm done with the fifth country, we will pop up that flash poll and you get a click which country you would visit if you had a chance to visit one of these countries next week. All right, we've got a new tease here. This is that Where's Rick game we've been playing. And I don't think anybody's seen this one yet. And remember, this is a chance for you to look at the teases, how we open our shows. We say, hey, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best year. This time we're doing this, that, and this, and that. Wonder where we are. We're in this place. We're gonna take a pause right there at that wonder where we are and let you guess where we are. If you get it wrong, you gotta take a drink. If you get it right, you gotta take a drink. Let's see where's Rick. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, exploring more of the best of Europe. This time, we're going medieval, cruising river gorges steeped in legend and climbing castles in the most romantic corners. Hmm. We are sailing the river, the most romantic corner of this country. This is the romantic gorge of probably the most famous river in Germany, lined with castles. And right now we're going by the Falls Castle, which is actually built in the middle of the river to levy tolls from all the ships that went by in the Middle Ages. They'd rise up their chain and you had to stop and pay your duty before they'd let that chain down. Where are we? Up Germany. The Rhine River in Germany. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. And this is one of about a million reasons this place is called the City of Light. Oh, the adorable, beloved Notre Dame. I was just there two weeks ago, and uh, of course, it's covered with scaffolding. They're working like mad on it to repair it after that devastating, tragic fire. But it's really still the heart and soul of this great city. You got it. We're in Paris. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're enjoying the delights of the French countryside. It's the chateaus. 
So French countryside, famous for chateaus. Look at that beautiful chateau. Each one of them surrounded by a beautiful garden. Where are we? Of the Loire River Valley. Ah, Thanks yeah. for joining us. And that is Shannon So. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're enjoying some underappreciated corners of Germany, both old and new. Underappreciated corner of Germany. Uh, not many Americans go to this place. Most Germans who leave their country when they emigrate, they leave from this port up in the north. And on the far distance on the right hand side, you see their new um, symphony hall. Oh, it's such a beautiful renovation of this entire third of the city. Where could we be? It's Hamburg and a whole lot more. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're in the south of France, mixing Roman ruins, fine wine, a little Van Gogh, and even a French bullfight. Get ready for, not a year, but an exhilarating half hour. Hmm, little tip there, a year in, kind of strange to have a bullfight in southern France, but in this, I was gonna say, Provence of France, you've got bullfights. Where are we? In Provence. All right. Hey, well, now we're going to carry on and we're going to visit a little country called San Marino. It's like, uh, like the Vatican. It's landlocked in Italy until 1870. Remember, there was no Italy. It was just a bunch of little feudal states. Uh, and this is one that happened to survive. Uh, and we'll explain why. But it's up on a hilltop, dramatically perched up there for defensive purposes. Today, it's just a short side trip from the touristic resorts along the Adriatic coastline. And it's inundated with tourists during the day. But at night, it's peaceful and dramatico. On the opposite side of the Italian peninsula, just a few miles inland from the Adriatic coast is another tiny nation that's entirely surrounded by Italy, San Marino. The Republic of San Marino brags it's the world's oldest and smallest republic. It's remained sovereign through almost all its 1700-year history. San Marino's isolated location has helped it maintain its independence. The 24-square-mile country clings bravely to Monte Titano in Italy's rugged Apennine Mountains. A thousand years ago, Italy was made up of dozens of independent little states like this. Over the centuries, virtually all of them disappeared from the map. First, Europe's dominant royal families snatched up these tiny territories and added them to their vast kingdoms. Then, in the 19th century, Italy's unification movement consolidated virtually the entire Italian peninsula into the modern nation of Italy. San Marino survived because of Giuseppe Garibaldi. A leader of the Italian unification movement, Garibaldi hid from his enemies here in San Marino. In appreciation, Garibaldi allowed San Marino to remain independent. Perched above the old town are San Marino's three characteristic castles. This trio of fortresses has done its part to keep San Marino free and independent over the centuries. A ridgetop trail connects the fortresses. Since the 1960s, tourism has brought prosperity, and along with it, streets of tacky shops. About half the country's economy is based on tourism. As in other tiny states, quirky laws and tax regulations are used to stoke the economy. As sales tax is half what it is in surrounding Italy, shoppers have long come here for the savings. Several of Europe's tiny countries produce their own stamps and coins, much sought after by collectors. Buongiorno. A stamp for my passport, please? And for a fee, they'll even stamp your passport. So this was a big deal back in the old days when travelers would uh, try to collect stamps on their passports. Frankly, I try to avoid getting stamps on my passports now because when I cross a border and there's too many stamps on it, they kind of look at you twice and wonder, why are you traveling so much? Um, yeah, right, a travel writer. Uh, but um, in the old days, we'd line up and even pay to get our passport stamped. One thing collectors can do is collect coins. I forget if I've showed this to you yet, 
But this, I'm a coin collector, and this is my Euro collection. You can find Euro stops, especially when you're in Belgium, because that's the capital of the European Union. But I, you know, you got to remember, Europe has the Euro coins. These are my Euro coins. And um, every, there's, you know, nickel, diamond, quarter, and all that sort of thing. Uh, on one side, it's the same all over Europe. But on the other side, it is unique to that country, whether it's uh, Italy or Ireland or Luxembourg or the Netherlands or Poland or Belgium or Austria or Deutschland or Espana or France or Finland. Those are the ones that I've got here. And it is fun to collect them. There are a few obscure countries that are so rare, they don't even put them in the book like this. San Marino and the Vatican, they've got Euro coins, but they're such limited production that as soon as they are put into um, circulation, people snap them right up because they're worth a heck of a lot. But you can collect that. And it is fun to get to be um, recognizing what country of the Euro zone do you have on your coin? And it has, if it's in Ireland, it has the harp. And if it's in Germany, it'll have the, the eagle and all of this sort of thing. So you'll be able to have some fun that way. By the way, I mentioned earlier that I brought my Swiss army knife to Europe for the first time in a long time. I had to check a bag. I always carry on bags when I go to Europe. So I don't want to bring this because I can't carry that on. But I brought my walking sticks because I was hiking around Mount Blanc and I needed those hiking poles and I couldn't carry that on. So I brought a little extra bag and I put my Swiss army knife and my hiking poles in it and my boots and so on. But the cool thing about this is I had this every day on the top of a mountain pass hiking around Mount Blanc, slicing up my bread and my cheese and my sausage, having an amazing hike. I did the Tour de Mont Blanc with three friends. And the Tour de Mont Blanc is a classic long distance hike. It's 100 miles in 10 days for most people. We cheated. We cherry picked. We did the best six days in 60 miles, 10 miles a day. And we did it with a company where they set up your hotels or your mountain lodges and they take your bags ahead to every one of the hotels. So you're just walking around with your poles, with your bag, with your lunch and your sweater and your rain gear in it and your Swiss army knife. Uh, we hiked through France, Italy, and a little bit of Switzerland on that. And then we spent a couple of days in Paris. And um, I'm not gonna get into a big thing about what's going on in Europe right now. And I wanna stress, I'm not promoting going to Europe right now because it is, it's a sensitive time with the dangers of COVID and all this thing. But personally, I needed to get over there and I went over there and I wanted to find out from our work point of view, just how complicated is it? Because there are so many people that misread the headlines and they freak out and then everybody else freaks out because they're freaking out. And I found it was very straightforward. I'd say a third of our staff has been to Europe this year and we are having a blast doing it. You gotta have your CDC card. That means you gotta be vaccinated. Uh, and how you get out of the United States depends on what airline you choose and so on. But if you have your CDC card, that's, that was good enough for me. Coming into France, we were supposed to have the French QR code where you're universal, I've got my shots, but they were overwhelmed, they couldn't do it. So for foreigners, if you have your own country's CDC card, that worked just great. But I'll tell you, the world is getting really small for people who refuse to get their vaccinations. And I won't get off on my rant about that, but it is so elementary. Once we get our vaccinations, we can travel again, period. Europe was behind us, now they're ahead of us. Europe respects this. There's a few people that don't, but in general, I felt Europe was great. And uh, we could not go to a hotel. We could not go to a museum. We could not get onto a train without our CDC card. But if we had that in our hand, it's just like traveling normal. We wore our masks when we were in museums. We wore our masks when we were on the airplane, but otherwise it felt really good. And uh, being for a week on Mount Blanc, hiking around that Blanc Massif from Chamonix all the way around back to Chamonix, it was like there was no COVID. And then when we got to Paris, it was great. There was all the liveliness in the streets. The museums were as good as ever, less crowded for sure. And to get home, of course, you had to have your vaccination, but you also needed to get back into the United States, the way I understood it, um, negative COVID test. And some people were, again, freaking out about that, but it's elementary. Talk to the hotel at your last stop. They've got nonstop people going to the airport trying to get out of the country. They know what's going on. We brought our little kit from home, but we didn't use it. I just wanted to go to a local pharmacy in Paris, cost 25 bucks. It took 20 minutes. The hotel said it's just around the corner, drop in. We went there, they did the little test. We hung around for half an hour, went back in. We got our printed out sheet that said we are negative. And then a day later, scooted right through the airport and we were home. So I don't know, I think we're on a trajectory for normalcy. Our tours are 
tuned in. We've got our tours almost sold out for next year. And God willing, if things keep going in this direction, we will be more comfortable than we are now even helping people enjoy European travel. So um, to all of you who are dreaming about Europe, I think that's good news. And stay tuned because Cameron Hewitt has just got back yesterday from an extensive trip around Europe. And Cameron and I are gonna share our lessons from traveling during COVID in about a month. So stay tuned right here on Monday Night Travel. Now we're gonna head back to a little bit of Little Europe and we're gonna go back to San Marino. The town's focal point is the long, balcony-like Piazza della Libertà with sweeping views over the realm. The statue depicting Liberty wearing a crown with the three castle towers celebrates this country's passion for independence and democracy. The Palazzo Publico, or Palace of the People, is guarded by some of San Marino's tiny security force in their distinctive uniforms. A modest stairway leads to the room from where the country is governed. Paintings remind legislators of its long history and the saint who's considered the father of this little nation. Hmm. In about the year 300, Marino, a stonecutter from present-day Croatia, fled persecution from the Roman emperor. He found refuge here on Monte Titano and decided to stay and help a community of other fleeing Christians. He was made a saint for his efforts and remains the patron saint of this country to this day. So at this point, I'm thinking as a TV producer, I need to amp up San Marino a little bit. It was just not that exciting. And suddenly we stumbled into a medieval festival and crossbow archers. And wow, San Marino started to really sparkle. Hold on to your castanets. Check this out. From this lofty perch, San Marino's soldiers have defended their homeland with the latest in military technology. Ever since a key victory back in the 15th century, the crossbowmen of San Marino have been a part of state celebrations. Traditionally, this forced the marksmen to stay sharp and keep their crossbows in good working order. While well, today it's mostly an excuse to show off for tourists, their sport is still taken seriously. The marksmen hit their target with armor-piercing force, illustrating the pride of a nation with a long, if not mighty, heritage. As if celebrating their bullseyes, the San Marino Crossbowman Federation enlivens their mountaintop republic with traditional fanfare. San Marino takes you back to the age of city-states, an era of pageantry, pride, and fierce independence. Further north lies another pint-sized country that's tucked away not on a hill, but in the mighty Alps. Two centuries ago, there were dozens of independent states in German-speaking Europe. Today, there are only four, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and Liechtenstein. Nestled between Switzerland and Austria, the Principality of Liechtenstein is defined by the mighty Alps to the east, the Baby Rhine River to the west, and a stout fortress protecting the mouth of its valley to the south. This quirky remnant of medieval feudal politics is just about 62 square miles. It's truly landlocked without a seaport or even an airport. Liechtensteiners, who number about 35,000, speak German, are mostly Catholic, and have a stubborn independent streak. Women weren't given the vote until 1984. The country's made up of 11 villages. The village of Triesenberg, high above the valley, gathers around its onion-domed church which recalls the settlers who arrived here centuries ago from the western part of Switzerland. The town of Vaduz sits on the valley floor. 
While it has only 5,000 people, it's the country's capital. Its pedestrianized main drag is lined with modern art and hotels, bordering a district of slick office parks. Historically, Europe's tiny countries have offered businesses special tax and accounting incentives. For a place with such a small population, Liechtenstein has a lot of businesses. Many European companies locate here to take advantage of its low taxes. And that's how the Prince of Liechtenstein, whose castle is perched above his domain, likes it. The billionaire prince who looks down on his 6 by 12 mile country wields more real political power in his realm than any other European royalty. The National Museum tells the story of the prince and his country. Their family crest dates to the Middle Ages when the Liechtenstein family was close friends with the Habsburg family who ruled the Holy Roman Empire. In fact, there is a Liechtenstein palace in Vienna and they had their connections with the Habsburgs, of course, and they had to have their palace there. It is still run and owned by the Liechtenstein family. And as far as I know, it has been open to the public for uh, to be visited. It's quite an impressive palace. The Liechtenstein family purchased this piece of real estate from the Holy Roman Emperor. In 1719, the domain was granted principality status, answering only to the emperor. The Liechtenstein princes, who lived near Vienna, saw their new country merely as a status symbol, and didn't even bother to visit for decades. In fact, it wasn't until the 20th century that the first Liechtenstein prince actually lived here. Hmm. In 1806, during the Napoleonic Age, Liechtenstein's obligations to the Habsburg Emperor disappeared, and the country was granted true independence. Later, after World War I, tough times forced the principality to enter into an economic union with Switzerland. To this day, Liechtenstein enjoys a close working relationship with its Swiss neighbors. And like Switzerland, a big part of its modern economy is tourism and sports, hosting visitors enjoying its dramatic natural beauty. Ski lifts, busy both winter and summer, take nature lovers to the dizzying ridge that serves as the border with Austria. Mm. Even in little, little Liechtenstein, the views are big and the hiking possibilities go on and on. Oh, that's so beautiful. Think about this country. I mean, there you see the ridge. That's the border, that ridge between Liechtenstein and Austria to the east. And if you turn around 180 degrees at your feet, you've got the Rhine River going north and south, little baby Rhine River. Well, it's sizable, but it's not as big as you see in Germany. And then that's the border between Liechtenstein and Switzerland. And then the prince has his palace on the bluff with his back to the mountains and his front overlooking his domain with the river and the rest of Switzerland. It's so beautiful. We used to stop by Liechtenstein for years on our tours. If you're driving around, it's just right there. The, the Autobahn goes straight down along the Rhine and you can take a left and drop in, park in Vaduz and check out another country. When I see this shot, it makes me want to yodel. When I'm really happy, I want to yodel. And once when I was a kid, not a kid, I was in my 20s, I was leading a tour and I had a bus full of um, women. I, I was just women that signed up for my tours in the old days. Uh, and um, they were looking around and there was a good looking Swiss guy hitchhiking. They said, pick him up. I said, I'm only going to pick him up if he earns the ride. He must teach us how to yodel. So his name was Christoph. I remembered quite vividly. And we uh, stopped and he looked at my bus with me and eight American women. And, um, and these, I said, do you want to ride? He said, sure. And I said, then you got to teach us how to yodel. <laughs> so we all got out of the car. We stood in the bluff and Christoph yodeled for us. It was so cool. And I learned how to yodel. And I don't yodel very often, but when I'm really happy and I'm with a group on a bus, I do yodel. I yodeled a couple of years ago when I was leading our best of the, my way tour of the Alps. And it was caught on video. And I thought, okay, what do I have to lose? I'll share with you me yodeling the yodel that Christoph taught me that I like to share with our groups. Because when we do a Rick Steves tour, our middle name is experience. And we should all be yodeling when we're happy in the mountains. There's Christoph on the right. Yoduli, 
And then you ovulate. I mean, then you modulate. Faster. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was fun. Thank you for letting me share that. Had a quick little look at Ben Cameron. Ben Cameron is on our guides, uh, um, you know, support staff here in Edmonds. And uh, Ben and I are both going to go uh, to Italy in two weeks and meet a bunch of our guides and have a guide mentoring tour. I just love to share my passion for Europe and my idea about how we like to do our tours with our guides. And we'll be with 20 or so new guides and we'll be just teaching very carefully what makes a Rick Steves tour a uh, Rick Steves tour. Hey, right now we're looking at Monaco or Monte Carlo. Monaco is the country. Monte Carlo is the city, if I understand it correctly. And along with the Vatican City, of the five countries we're visiting today, this is the one that you can walk across and truly say, I walked across the whole country today as I was sightseeing. On the Mediterranean Sea, basking between the French and Italian Rivieras, the Principality of Monaco barely fits on its one square mile of territory. Of its 30,000 residents, less than 10,000 are true Monegasques, as locals are called. Many of the rest call Monaco home because there's no income tax. Despite overdevelopment, high prices, and mobs of tourists, a visit here is a Riviera must. And Monaco is a work in progress. The district of Fonvier was reclaimed from the sea. It bristles with luxury high-rise condos. The breakwater, constructed elsewhere and towed in, enables cruise ships to dock. And cars still race, as they have since 1929, around the Principality in one of the world's most famous auto races, the Grand Prix of Monaco. The minuscule Principality has always been tiny, but it used to be less tiny. In the 1860s, it lost most of its territory to France, but the prince built a casino and managed to connect his domain to the rest of the Riviera with a new road and a train line. Hmm. Humble Monaco was suddenly on the Grand Tour map, the place for the vacationing aristocracy to play. Today, the people of Monaco have one of the world's highest per capita incomes with plush apartments to match. Its famous casino allows the wealthy to enjoy losing money in extreme comfort. And that's as close as we could get our TV camera to that space. So you'll have to imagine what it's like inside. If Monaco is a business, the prince is its CEO. While the casino generates only a small part of the state's revenue, its many banks, which provide an attractive way to protect your money from the tax ban, earn much more. There is no income tax here, but the prince collects plenty of money in value-added taxes, real estate taxes, and corporate taxes. By the way, uh, when you take a Mediterranean cruise, typically you'll stop in, quote, the French Riviera. But you don't know where you're going to be in the French Riviera. And uh, tip, um, normally the boats have one of three ports to stop or drop the hook in. Monte Carlo, where I see here, Nice or Villefranche. Uh, either way, they're all close together by train. The train links each of these cities. Monaco has a beautiful train station. Half an hour away is um, Nice with another wonderful train station, always within an easy walk of the action in that town. If you do have your ship um, drop the hook or, or tie up in uh, Monte Carlo, I believe they normally drop the hook, you'll tender in, you'll find that the, the dock or the uh, entrance point is right at the end of this uh, pier there and uh, awaiting you 
is a company that rents little golf cart uh, cars that you can tool around town in. And there is a convenient little touristy hop on hop off train or bus that takes you from one stop to the next all around town. It's quite easy to enjoy Monaco in a couple of hours. Nearly all of Monaco's sites are packed in a Cinderella neighborhood atop its fortified hill. Its impressive aquarium, which proudly crowns the cliff like a palace, was directed by Jacques Cousteau for 17 years. A medieval castle sat where Monaco's palace sits today. The palace square features a statue of Francois Grimaldi, a renegade Italian who captured Monaco disguised as a monk in 1297. You know, just thinking, this is fascinating history. And I was thinking if anybody is like blinking and missing it, you can go to the TV section of our website, you can watch the show again, and you can also have the script right there. Um, the script's right there, you can print it out and you can read it because these countries, each of them, touristy and you know, kind of cutesy as they may be, they all have real history and a real story. First ruler of Monaco established the dynasty that still rules the principality. Today, over 700 years later, the current prince is his direct descendant. Palace guards protect the ruling Grimaldi family 24-7, and they change with the pageantry of an important nation. Every day at about noon, tourists pack the square to witness the spectacle in this improbable little princedom. Okay, so now is our last country, Andorra. And we went there from Barcelona. You're gonna to go to Barcelona. I bet there's a thousand people, tourists that go to Barcelona for every one that goes to Andorra. If you're hell bent on going to Andorra, get in your car and it's a long drive through the mountains to get this little remote mountain kingdom halfway right in the border between Spain and France. We kind of joked while we were doing this that you know some of these countries, we go there so you don't have to and we're showing it to you now. Andorra is a long drive, but here it is. Our final stop is Andorra, the biggest of these midget countries. If you're keeping track, here's a rundown on Europe's tiny derby showing each of these countries' relative size. The Vatican is the big little winner. Then comes Monaco, San Marino, Liechtenstein, and finally Andorra. Luxembourg is Europe's next smallest country. Small as it is, it would easily fit all five microstates within its borders. Andorra sits high in the craggy Pyrenees Mountains, as if hiding out between Spain and France. With 180 square miles and about 75,000 people, it's the largest of Europe's micro countries. The country has a long history. In their national anthem, Andorans sing of Charlemagne rescuing their land from the Moors back in 803. In the 13th century, Spanish and French nobles married. They agreed that the principality would be neither Spanish nor French. This unique feudal arrangement survives today. And while they have co-princes, one happens to be the president of France and the other a bishop in Spain, locals stress that their land is 100% independent. Until little more than a generation ago, Andorra was an impoverished and isolated backwater. Churches date back to the 12th and 13th centuries. Their stony Romanesque bell towers stand strong as the surrounding Pyrenees. That same local stone is used today as a building boom illustrates how lately the principality has flourished. Since World War II, the population has increased tenfold. Recently, Andorans have become quite wealthy. The mountains that kept the principality both isolated and poor are now a source of its prosperity. Hiking and skiing are understandably big business here. And Andorra employs those special economic weapons so popular among Europe's little states. Easy-going banking, duty-free shopping, and low, low taxes. It's morphed from a rough-and-tumble smuggler's haven to a high-tech, high-altitude shopper's haven, famous for its low prices. While Andorans speak Catalan and have an affinity for the Spanish region of Catalonia and Barcelona, the commercial environment here is international as can be. The country's capital and dominant city, Andorra La Vela, is a mostly modern town with the charm of a giant shopping mall. While most know this place for its shops and for what locals claim is the biggest spa in Europe, pockets of old world charm do hide out in the old center. The 
the Casa de la Valle is the country's parliament building. A private residence back in the 16th century, today it houses Andorra's claustrophobic parliament chamber. It has 28 seats. That's four representatives for each of the seven parishes, with portraits of the current co-princes on the wall. While a humble reminder of a simple past, Andorans still look to this building for leadership as their country builds an ever better life for its citizens. So, what do Andorra and the rest of Europe's little countries have in common? Most of them are high in the mountains or some other hard to reach terrain. Many offer low or no taxes, which encourage businesses and individuals from other countries to come and support the local economy. Each one has survived centuries of warfare, treaties, and reshaped borders, usually thanks to a combination of diplomatic skill and luck. All of them get by in the coattails of larger nations, and they're small and easy to overlook, so they can fall through the cracks without being noticed by the next big tyrant. Most important, all of them are sustained by an unwavering national pride in their unlikely yet enduring independence. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that. I did. That was really fun to see five little countries. In fact, we're going to try something now that I mentioned earlier. We're going to do, and Juliana, are we ready for this? We're going to do a flash Zoom poll. And the question is, which one of these countries would you like to go to next week if you had a chance to just pop in and spend a day to check it out. We've got about 15 seconds, so think about this. The Vatican City with its amazing museum, Monaco with a chance to go gambling and go to that amazing uh, aquarium, San Marino, the tiny little country high in the Alps in the, on the Apennine Mountains of Italy, Liechtenstein nestled in the Alps between Austria and Switzerland, and Andorra nestled in the mountains between Spain and France. What's your favorite? Give it a click, and then we will let you know which country won. Check it out. All right. Hey, um, Julianne, that was fun. Um, do we have some questions from our um, audience tonight? We do have some great questions, but first, could we have a word from our sponsor? You know, I would love to give you a word from our sponsor. As a matter of fact, I actually have a little video clip to talk about our audio book for the popular Rick Steves for the Love of Europe. I'm, this is the, the big project of early COVID times. We came out with this book and my publisher wanted me to read the whole thing. I spent five days in a hot little recording studio booth reading every page of this book. I thought it was gonna be a brutal experience, but it was wonderful. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And now we've got an audiobook version of this book that is quite popular. As a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, Audible, did a little promotion and they sold 5,000 copies of this audiobook in one day. They liked uh, the fact that it was read by the guy who wrote it. Check this out, this is kind of fun. I wanna show you um, a little moment in the studio as I was recording for the love of Europe. <laughs> Lorenzo, who ran Il Castello, was a rare Vernazzan who didn't take advantage of tourists held captive by his town's beauty. He'd sit me down under an umbrella with the most commanding view in town, and then with the love of a small town priest, he'd put a cookie next to my glass of cool, sweet Chakitra wine and say, rest here, the view is nice. Wow, I am just about done reading this brand new book. Rick Steves for the love of Europe. By the way, I got to say, this was during very scary COVID times when, you know, everybody was washing every doorknob and I was totally alone in here. I had to do this holding my iPhone uh, and guessing where it was going and so on. But it, it worked out pretty well, but I got to do my moving little selfie here. And I am so excited to be sharing with you my hundred favorite travel adventures in this collection of essays. If any book that I've written over the years 
is just made to order for an audiobook. It's got to be this one. I've been in this recording booth now for <laughs> five, seven hour stints, and I'm so excited about this book. If you're looking for an audiobook to take you to Europe, to stoke your travel dreams, be sure to get Rick Steves for the Love of Europe. Wow, Julian, that was, I mean, literally, that was a, a word from our sponsor with a, with a little video ad and everything. <laughs> now we've earned our Q&A time. Do we have some questions? Yes, first, you want to see the results from the poll? Oh, I'd love to. Okay, what was the most sure popular country? Guess, Rick, which one do you think out of the five? The Vatican. Oh, I was surprised with the results. Can you see? Yeah. The San oh, Marino. Look at that. Yeah, San Marino. Six votes. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Mm -hmm. and, and Monaco beat out Andorra for the bottom. That's fascinating. Yeah. We're going to do this more. I think that's really cool. So, San Marino and Liechtenstein, we should do a a little tour. We mm -hmm. should do one of our tours of <laughs> San Marino and Liechtenstein. You could do you could do Monaco, San Marino and Liechtenstein. That would be an interesting one. Long drive between each. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you everybody for sharing your opinion. And uh, great for San Marino, huh? Yeah. San Marino, yeah. it's a romantic little spot, I gotta say, and it's it's just tipping that 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 beautiful um, little hilltop. Mm -hmm. I guess that can roll into our first question from Kyle. Um, Rick, what is your favorite micro country? If you had to pick one. Hmm. Well, I don't think it's fair about the Vatican because the Vatican mm -hmm. is so much, you know, art mm -hmm. and history and everything. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. And if I was in the mood to um, hike, you know, Liechtenstein is beautifully situated. Um, Monte Carlo, I could take it or leave it. I, I guess I, I think, um, I can't say. I can't say. They all have their different um, appeal, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, uh, I would say uh, either the Vatican or Liechtenstein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about and, you, Julianne? Oh, gosh. Well, I've been to Monaco. Maybe a lot of viewers have been to Monaco, and that's why it was kind of lower on the list. San Marino looks kind of nice, and or <laughs> Liechtenstein sounds nice for the... I've never been to Rome, so <laughs> Vatican City is up there, but yeah. The crossbows were cool. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun. And during the um, during the show tonight, you talked about how a lot of the countries have an interesting history, even though they're such small countries. And but Rebecca was wondering, do any of these countries have unique cuisines? Do they have specific foods for each of them? Or no? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think so. If you ask them, they'd say, "Oh yeah, you know." But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, they are they're from the region. So Monte Carlo historically is, is just right next to Nice. So you've got that wonderful, uh, you know, French, the Côte d'Azur cuisine. Yeah. And up in the Pyrenees, you got that wonderful mountain cuisine and the same thing in Liechtenstein. And mm -hmm. of course, uh, in Vatican, you probably don't want to have dinner at the Vatican. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Catherine is wondering, are these countries best for day trips or should you stay overnight or stay nearby in other cities? Well, um, it's a long drive to get to Andorra for the day. So I think you'd want to spend the night there. Mm -hmm. Monte Carlo is great for a day trip. You know, I'd, I would far prefer to stay in Villefranche or Nice. I mm -hmm. always say in the French Riviera, if you want a big, the cultural capital is Nice. If you want a cute small town, port town, either Antibes or Villefranche. But any of those little famous towns along the French Riviera, Monte Carlo is just another one. They're on the same train line and the train comes by two or three times an hour. So uh, that's, you wouldn't need to, sp I would not spend the night in Monte Carlo. Um, in Liechtenstein, I wouldn't spend the night in really either. Uh, San Marino, you would spend the night because it's inundated with people from the cheesy uh, big Italian beach resorts uh, uh, half an hour away. And mm -hmm. they just come in and pack the place in the middle of the day. But at night, it's all yours. So I'd, I think a night in San Marino would be the best of anything. Yeah. Oh, okay. Very in nice. fact, that's a good point. You come in at the end of one day, it's a nice drive. You settle into your hotel four o'clock. You got a couple of hours of sightseeing before you know things with turnstiles close. You got a romantic evening, and then in the morning you do what you want to do and head on out. Mm -hmm. That does sound nice. Just yeah. fifteen hours in a micro country is just enough. <laughs> just enough. Yeah. If eight hours of it is sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> and we saw the Vatican today, of course. And Rhonda was wondering, with all of the years of traveling that you've done, have you ever had the opportunity to meet the Pope? No. He wanted to talk to me, but I was busy. 
<laughs> <laughs> no. no, when we did our Martin Luther show, that was when it was the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, 15 or 2017. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm a Lutheran and our bishop, our presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, was with the Pope because oh. they, they were doing all sorts of good things where Protestants and Catholics were realizing, hey, if Martin Luther lived today, we'd all think he was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, um, you know, uh, I thought maybe I'd finish the show with uh, Bishop Eaton and the Pope together. And that would have been really fun. Ooh. But then I realized uh, they got more important things to do than be on the Rick Steves travel <laughs> show. But I've never, um, I've, I've been in, in, the, in the masses when the Pope makes his appearance and it's quite exciting. It's, mm-hmm. it's sort of, it's not a very, um, it's a festive. It's not a somber uh, occasion at all. It's festive. I, I love it. It's all people from different countries throughout mostly the Catholic world. And um, there's something just, transcendent about the Pope. It's just so cool to be there with people from around the world. There's a, a special unity there. And to pack on the square, I highly recommend it if you get a chance. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see what next. Oh, and Sherry was wondering, can you get your passport stamped in any of these countries? It's tough to get your passport mm-hmm. stamped anywhere these days. Mm-hmm. I try. We used yeah. to, we'd go across borders and we'd choose the one person who could be the most um flirty or something to take everybody's passport and get these guys to stamp it and in the old days it worked you know yeah. and one person would go in 20 passports and they all come back we got our stamp <laughs> but now if you ask for a stamp they, they they look at you like you came from another planet yeah it's kind of a shame we've lost that because yeah. mine are kind of barren now you know there aren't any <laughs> <I> know, <laughs> stamps yeah. in there yeah yeah it used yeah. to be a romantic thing but now mm-hmm. it's just not not much of an option sadly yeah. mm-hmm. Courtney is wondering, what is the public transportation in these countries, if it's even needed? Can you walk everywhere? Do you need a car? No, it's good to have a bus. And there's, you know, Europe has great public transit. So Mm -hmm. if I just think offhand, little villages around Andorra, little villages speckled around uh, Liechtenstein, they'd all have bus connections. And it would go Mm -hmm. during regular work days, you know, every half hour you'd have a bus. Um, Monte Carlo, very good bus system. Uh, The Vatican, you don't need a bus. Uh, it's too small. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, San Marino. I don't. I don't know if you need a bus, but uh, if you need public transit, there certainly is it. Yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, what is this person's name? They had an interesting question. There. Oh, David was wondering: um, Do many expats live in these countries, or is it just local? Well, it's all a ta- mm-hmm. matter of taxes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's yeah. why these countries yes. are thriving, and they've mm-hmm. got a huge industry in just keeping people's money. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some cases, people pay to keep their. They get negative interest. To have secret bank accounts, you know, mm-hmm. and I don't know the latest on these things, but Liechtenstein and Monte Carlo, they are, their, their economy is based on this kind of banking. Uh, as I mentioned, Andorra for years and years was famous as a duty-free shop. That's where people would go. Borders are always where you've got things being sold on one side instead of the other because of taxes and so on and duty-free. So San Marie, um, Andorra was, a th- like I called it, a glorified shopping mall. I used to call it a Spanish-speaking um, radio shack. Uh, you know, that's, that's really what it was. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I'll be going, but it still sounds nice. It's not, it's not, <laughs> yeah. it's not their advertising slogan. Yeah. It's an Ad Nora, Spanish speaking Radio Shack. I've got the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and when we were in uh, Monaco tonight, you mentioned the Grand Prix, the big um, race. Yeah. Denise was wondering, have you ever been to Monaco during the race? No, no. <laughs> I've, I, when I, if I was there, I'm, I'm working almost always. Mm-hmm. And if that was going on, I couldn't do any work nothing yeah. would be open. It would all be dominated to that. And I'm just not in Europe to spend a day at a car race. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'd like to have on vacation, but I'm there to yeah. work. And it's, yeah. I feel like an old uh, curmudgeon. I mean, if there's a festival, sometimes I go, drat, I can't do my work. You know, why are all these people having a good time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, Leanne. Okay. Well, quite a few people were wondering about your um, hike that you did around Mont Blanc. And oh, yeah. do you know, do you remember the name of the company that you use to tour around Mont Blanc? Yeah, but there's a lot of companies that mm-hmm. are just great. It's pretty much mm-hmm. a lot of the same stuff. I mean, it was great, but I don't want to promote one country over the other. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll talk more about it. And I'll talk about that company on Monday Night Travel coming down. Right now, I'm just mm-hmm. working on my slideshow. But I'll tell you, it was the experience of a lifetime to, to work this old body for six days in a row. 10 miles. I'm not talking 10 miles on a treadmill. That's one thing I learned. 10 miles on a treadmill is a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. It's not even a walk in the park. It's a walk on a treadmill. (laughs) I was, it was rocks. It was up. It was scampering. It took, if it said five hours, it took us eight hours. Mm -hmm. I I would not have done it without my poles. Um, Every day it was a 3000 mile 
a 3,000 um, uh, foot, 1,000 meter gain. Wow. That's, a half, that's more than a half a mile straight up, mm-hmm. climbing rocks and stuff. And uh, we did a hike to practice in, in Washington State here, Mount Sai, which mm-hmm. is, for me, it was pretty brutal. It was 3,000 feet up. And I'm so glad we did that because we did it fine. And we would call, that's a unit, a Mount Sai. And when we were in the Alps, it was a Mount Sai. Every morning, it was a Mount Sai. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'd come up there. And then we'd get to the mountain pass. And then the rest of the day, you're just in your glory. And St. Francis called his body Brother Mule. And I started calling my body Brother Mule. His <laughs> Brother Mule had four more days of this. Three more days of this. One more day, Brother Mule. And uh, I'll talk more about it when we do that. But uh, stay tuned. That's going to be coming up on a Monday night travel, I believe, in uh, November. Okay. I just loved it, though. Mm-hmm. And our last question for, t- for tonight is from Edward. And it's kind of a fun question. He said he and his viewing partner have noticed that you use the word evocative, evocative in many of your shows. Is there an inside joke of why you put this word in there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I get the, the meaning exactly right, but yeah. I love things that are evocative. I want things to be, to me, it's thought provoking. It's, mm-hmm. it's thought provoking. It makes you think. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have our bingo card. I was just thinking when we, um, when I was doing something earlier in this very um, evening here, uh, when I went to the website, I saw the, the bingo cards uh, on the website and we have an actual bingo game that goes with all of our shows and one of the squares is fill this in when rick says evocative Mm -hmm. so there's a few words i overuse and uh i just think using them so much carbonates your experience (laughs) but um i just looked up the definition rick of evocative it's evoking or tending to evoke an especially emotional response. <laughs> well, that's a lousy dictionary yeah, when they use the same word to define what's evocative. Well, it's something that's times. evoking. <laughs> yeah. Well, did, I'm sorry, an, an emotional experience? An emotional response. Mm-hmm. There you go. Mm-hmm. It's, it's evocative. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> hey, this, Julianne, thanks you for, for reading all the news, uh, the questions. I do want to remind you, we've got lots of great Monday night travel coming up. Next week, it's the Netherlands without Amsterdam. Imagine doing a TV show and not going to Amsterdam on the Netherlands. And it's a killer show. And after that, we're going to go to Turkey with Lolly. And Lolly is one of the great guides of Turkey. And I love Turkey. So I hope you can check that out. And right now, I just want to thank you for joining us. And I want to finish things off in the spirit of Monday Night Travel with some bloopers. Okay, so here's a few, just a minute or two of Rick screwing up so that you can remind your friends and favorite travel partner that we're going to meet together again next Monday. Happy travels. ...is the capital of Europe, Paris. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, oh! <laughs> Hair good? <laughs> Hair good. A little, little trimness on the hook. Yeah. <laughs> and then they would pause to reflect upon the meaning of life. <laughs> the great Phoenician rogue Casanova did so cool i can't believe it all right deep breath deep breath venetian society chose to a dance okay this is no pillow this time okay are you holding or letting go well. <laughs> <laughs> So all the glass factories here on this yes, island? Yes, yes. Why? Uh, because it uh, was a fortress of uh, safety. Safety. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Piero, can you pour me some wine, please, sir? <laughs> so, oh, yeah. I would love a little wine. Okay. Yeah, we need lots of wine. Yes, yeah. to have a good party yeah. and good meat, yeah. good, <laughs> good cheese, good cheese oh, as yeah. well. You are turning me on. <laughs> Once you dress like this, it's, it's very hard to be quite yourself. I bet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. These are boaters down here, so that's really? the sort of so thing that you. So this is a boaters you... <laughs> here. So if you're, if you're on a on a punt. <laughs> yes, in maybe something like that. It's yes, very dashing, huh? Um, mm, not quite oh, dashing. Can... So <laughs> Chubby fountain. Look at this. Are you yeah. How are you? Shut up. Shut up. <laughs>